This is an Eye on Annapolis special update. I'll let, you give you, let me give you my thoughts about the state of the city. Annapolis is strong and the citizens are fighting to make it stronger. We don't always agree with each other, so decisions are not easy, but we all care in our own different ways. We all want to protect what is unique in this city and at the same time reach our full potential for generations to follow. This last year, a major piece of both protecting our city and the ability to move forward was getting our finances straight and transparent. City Manager Theresa Sutherland has been on the job for about a year now. In that time, she has strengthened the supervisory role that the City Manager plays. She brought her accounting and auditing expertise to make the City's finance finances organised and understandable. She hired Jody Dickinson as a finance director. A lot of corrections have been made in the budgeting process and in arranging the structure of city government. I'd like to talk about some of the specifics. The operating budget process has been revamped. The capital budget process has been revamped. We have drafted a purchasing ordinance. We have made, we have made sure that all departments are accountable for not overspending. We have improved our bond rating for water and sewer. In the arena of finance, we were left to correct poor management decisions in place before my time. I was shocked to learn of a secondary set of books called revolving funds, where departments were getting funding after appropriations ran out. Now, all monies expended in the city are budgeted. For our future, we have made sure the city is aggressively addressing infrastructure finance needs. That requires innovation and substantive change in how we, the city partners with the community and looks at the public-private partnership arena. We will present operating and capital budgets to make it easier for city council members and the public to understand how taxpayer dollars are being spent. The budget books will be posted on the city website tomorrow for the first time in this format. In other areas, we are searching for ways to bring in revenue that doesn't have us asking residents to pay more taxes, fees or fines. The legislative session closing tonight without the final gavel from Speaker Bush has provided the City of Annapolis in future years a guaranteed annual payment as the state capital. Speaker Bush, Senator Sarah Elfrith and Delegate Alice Kane realised that since the city provides public safety services, including police, fire and MS, EMS for the legislature, the governor and state agencies that operate in Annapolis, a payment was important as we we're obliged to deliver the services. We don't collect taxes on any state property. The costs are roughly 750000 per year, but we only received a little more than 360000 a year about half of what the city spends. And the allocation had not been increased since 1996. We were happy to see it pass unanimously in the Senate, and with a strong veto-proof majority in the House, it was not vetoed by the Governor. In addition, the bill indexed the pilot funds to inflation. So even after we are long gone, the city won't have to keep begging the state to pay their fair share. We are grateful for the support of Speaker Bush, Senator Elfrith and Delegate Alice Kane, and those who worked on this legislation. We've also worked on some additional revenue opportunities in the form of grants and alternative revenue streams. We received 20000 to paint bike road sharing arrows or sharrows on area roads and install uh, road signs to make riding bicycles safer but for both cyclists and cars. That's from the Downtown Annapolis Partnership. We received our annual Housing and Urban Development Community 
block grant for 260,000 260, to help us realise viable urban development. The fire department received a grant for 20,000 to conduct training for residents. We found that we weren't collecting the taxes that people were paying for online hotel bookings on Priceline and other platforms. We are working with those platforms and the county to collect our money. One of the things we're looking at for the future is the ability to apply our hotel tax on Airbnb, VRBO and other customers. This is a pass, this is a pass through, so it won't cost local residents renting their homes anything, but it has the potential to bring in revenue that we can collect from these online home sharing apps. Other municipalities are doing it this and we, should, we shouldn't miss out. I'd like to thank Teresa and Jody. I didn't mean to bring you flowers, but I ran out of time today. So. And members of the City Council for helping us get the city finances on the right footing. And let's only want to give them a round of applause. All of these financial directives not only give residents more confidence in city government, they help build confidence that Annapolis is open for business. I'd like to mention and recognise some local businesses. Mind you, these aren't the only success stories, but it puts a human face on the business side of our city. Orsted is one of America's leading offshore wind developers. They have chosen to put their headquarters in the city of Annapolis. Can we have a round of, of applause for Joy Weber? Would you please stand up, Joy? Thank you. Thank you for making the decision to place your trust here and your business here in the city. Another success story goes back 50 years. Art Things in Western Annapolis had a great run when the owners decided to retire. New owners, Sky Vasquez and her husband, Jonas Miguel Vasquez, took a chance and are now finding their own success in the same store in the same location. Congratulations to the Vasquez family. Please stand and be recognised. Another kind of business success is the Chesapeake Bay Trust. They brought an old marine building in Eastport, renovated it for offices, and continued marine use as they award grants for bay cleanup. Also in the past, I think we should give them a clap because they do so much for us. <laughs> Also in the past, we've had 61 existing businesses expand or relocate within the city. This equates to jobs for 407 people. 14 businesses have transferred to new ownership, preserving 154 jobs. 36 new businesses have opened in the city, creating 257 jobs. Annapolis has made some prestigious lists, including Wallet Hubs, Best Small City in America, National Geographic's list, of best small cities in America at number five, and smart asset named Annapolis, one of the best cities, state capitals to live in. If you're thinking about opening or expanding your business in Annapolis, we would love to have you. Just gonna do this so I don't get Marco Rubio. My joke. Along with taking, uh, <laughs> Along with uh, talking about how Annapolis business friend is business friendly, we want to become the resilience capital. A recent study published by Stanford University looked at the economic costs to the city and businesses of continuous flooding events in downtown. Their taste case for this study was the city of Annapolis. Climate change and resulting flood events, which are both more frequent but also more severe are costing local businesses money. Businesses, especially in the historic district, lose revenue when the number of visitors dip during a flood event, either because people can, can't park and they leave the city to do their shopping and sightseeing somewhere else, but also because after the, a, a few false starts, visitors don't put an atlas on their list of places to go in the first place. City coffers also suffer. 
we don't get the revenue from parking fees. The Stanford study illustrated in real dollars that the city and businesses miss out on hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue by not addressing infrastructure problems in downtown. That is why we are working with city planners, public works, the finance office and federal agencies to secure funding for a short-term and long-term solution to the ongoing flooding issue around City Dock. We are experimenting with a short-term solution on City Dock that could be ready by summer and will help businesses with the ongoing flooding issues. Ellie's very excited about that plan. We, we can't wait to make that announcement. We'll also be installing a pump system along both sides of Ego Alley. We'll be working alongside the US Naval Academy because they are working on solutions for their ongoing flooding issues. We are partners in resolving th these issues for businesses, visitors, and of course, residents. During my campaign, one of the things I often mention was that when you first come to Annapolis and you look down Main Street, you can't help but fall in love with this city. That is why I decided to stay here. It's why I decided to start a business here. And it's why I'm raising my family here. But well, we aren't going to be able to love that view and love the historic district and love City Dock if we don't do something to support the infrastructure changes that are needed. In addition to the capital improvement to get the floodwaters out, a study from the Urban Land Institute looked at how to make the most of City Dock for the most people. They met with stakeholders and came up with a plan and recommendations for improving City Dock. Last month, the newly convened City Dock ULI Action Committee and working groups met for the first time. The action team is chaired by former City Planning and Zoning Director Eileen Fogarty, and I know she's there in the front row. Thank you for all your time. <laughs> Along with working groups, a total of about 90 people, they have a timeline to get an implementation plan to the City Council by fall. To be clear, this is an Im implementation plan. They're not adding new plans or studies to the mix. We've done enough of those. Just recommending how to get the ULI recommendations done. I'd like to recognise Ellen again for loving this city <laughs> uh, enough to take on this topic. You're a brave woman. Uh, all these people uh, and all those people are going to get us some results. So let's have another round for all the people. In the This exercise is the kind of civic participation that enriches our community because there is a resident buy-in. I hope you'll attend some of these meetings and weigh in where appropriate. City Dock may exist in Ward 1, but it's really the crown jewel of the entire city. For meeting agendas and details, please visit annapolis.gov slash city dock. One other thing in downtown, I'm very happy that we saw the reopening of the market house. It is doing very well and has become a favourite place for lunch and happy hour. I'm happy to see it thriving. Annapolis is surrounded by miles and miles of shoreline and the water that surrounds it has, a long, has long been neglected. It is polluted with trash. Stormwater runoff has not been controlled in the meaningful way We've taken out trees for development without considering which ones were the most important for preventing erosion and slowing runoff. I've made a commitment to work on environmental priorities, and we have a few things I'd like to list for you specifically around waterways. We've established a waterways cabinet. These are stakeholders from the community, including non-profits and representatives of the environmental organisations alongside city public works and planning and zoning personnel. This group will meet a couple of times a year and bring relevant information to our office. The City Council has passed a styrofoam ban. The county passed a similar legislation at the end of last week and we learned the State of Maryland followed our lead and also passed a statewide ban. The Department of Planning and Zoning established a cultural resource hazard mitigation plan 
while Public Works instituted energy conservation contracts on all city facilities. The new water treatment plant came online and won a major green building award from the Maryland Green Building Council. We opened a solar park on the old city landfill. We had the harbour master, city workers and volunteers pull debris out of Ego Alley and along the shoreline after the kind of Wingo Dam release. The harbour master removed nine abandoned boats from Upper Spar Creek. We increased forest protection. David Gerrell, our Director of Public Works, implemented a policy requiring 100% of stormwater mitigation on redevelopment higher than what the county requires. The budget being introduced tonight increases funding for tree canopy goals by 53,000. The budget also includes an additional stormwater management engineer to enhance and expedite environmental goals. These are just a few measures the city has undertaken to begin to make our waterways swimmable and fishable. One of the ways I, I hope to further strengthen our, environment, our environmental commitments is something I will be formally announcing later tonight, and that is my intention to elevate environmental policy into the Mayor's office. I'm doing this for the residents of our city today, but I'm also doing it for my children and the residents of our city in the future. Last year, Annapolis joined a list of now 80 cities with mass killings. The tragic mass shooting at the Capitol Gazette office. I'd first like to call out our Annapolis Police and Fire Department for acting with professionalism and dignity. Annapolis Police Officer Wesley Callow and Brian Chris are here tonight to accept our thanks. They were some of the first officers at the scene. Thank you for your bravery. Here tonight, I'd like to recognise the following police officers at the scene. Gwen Table, John Murphy, Jim McGriff, Christopher Baum, Ed Cooper, Larry, Larry Delanus, Tony Thomas, Ryan Holby and Tim Laith. This was a horrible blow for our city. Just a week before this event, the Annapolis Fire and Office of Emergency Management had conducted, conducted active assailant preparedness drills. These practiced skills and training helped save citizens' lives and secure evidence for the criminal case. Fire Department personnel on the scene and entering the building include Battalion Chief Carol Spriggs, Captain Philip Morris, Lieutenant Stephen Truesdale and Firefighter Kenneth Bloodsworth and Firefighters Stephen Baird. Captain Morris, Lieutenant Truesdale and Firefighter Bloodsworth are here tonight. Please stand. We'd like to give them a round of applause. Residents joined hands and marched down Main Street for a candlelight vigil at Susan B. Campbell Park. We held a benefit concert where ticket sales raised more than 63,000 and were matched for more than 100,000 to help survivors and the victims' families. We made a stand for the First Amendment. The Capitol staff marched with us on July 4th. This city came together in compassion and love. We supported the local journalists who tell our stories and write the history of this wonderful city. <laughs> Annapolis residents also showed we care when the young people, including our community in our community, came together on March for Our Lives. We held a march here in the city of Annapolis. I believe that young people are going to help us turn the corner on the ongoing story of mass shootings. 
Mackenzie Bowie, who organised the Annapolis March for Our Lives event, has been at the nu a number of panel discussions and events in the aftermath of the Capitol Gazette shooting. I'd like to recognise Mackenzie for bringing attention to this issue and continuing to be a young activist. Mackenzie. But it doesn't end there. We need to end the scourge of mass shootings. Since 2000, there have been 80 mass shootings in America. That number doesn't include Columbine or other shootings that happened in the prior century. Tomorrow and Wednesday, I will be in Toledo, Ohio, at a national conference for mayors working with the leaders of other municipalities. I don't want another city or town to have to go through what we had experienced. I'm committed to working with people of all parties at all levels of government to find solutions. Earlier this month, the General Assembly passed a joint resolution declaring June 28th Freedom of the Press Day. I'd also like to announce that we will be having an event on June 28th, a Remembrance Concert. I invite everyone to attend and remember Rebecca, Wendy, Rob, Gerald and John. Another of the themes I ran on was to build a community and bridge divides across all wards. We call this One Annapolis. And we are happy to partner with every member on the City Council on ongoing events, including One Block at a Time, where we visit residents and businesses. It's a great way to check in with one another. I'd like to highlight some of the other outreach events we've hosted in the past year. We held community engagement and listening sessions on a variety of topics, the most recent of which is the one where we are asking residents to tell us the qualities and characters they want to see in a new city police chief. We've hosted business roundtables for African-American business owners and Hispanic business owners. We've hosted a women's empowerment seminar at Pitt Moyer. We run English language programs for Hispanic adults and after-school programs for youth. The Stanton Centre has hosted 335 meetings last year and served 550 people Thanksgiving dinner. I have hired a diverse and proactive staff in my office. But one of the issues that is serious and has caused me great concern for our city is the opioid epidemic. We are tackling this issue head on. To provide some perspective, in 2016, we had 122 overdoses, 10 of which were fatal. Narcan, an opiate antagonist, was used 50 times. One year later, we've had 173 overdoses and 12 fatalities, and Narcan was used 109 times. In my first year in office, we deployed more Narcan than any previous year at 137. We suffered one fewer fatality than the year before at 11, but the total number of overdoses went up to 199. That is an average of 16 overdoses per month for the last year. That is 16 a month too many. The three programs that we are working on are the NapTown anti-dope movement. This is where we offer events for people to attend where they can hear stories of recovery. But they also gather resources for themselves and their families and friends who might be suffering from addiction. Your Life Matters is the second one. This is where our fire department offer Narcan training and CPR to anyone who asks for it. We also have safe stations programs at local police and fire stations if someone requests assistance. They will be provided with medical assessments. They don't need immediate medical attention. They will be connected with crisis response teams to provide further access to treatment and follow-up care. The third is OD Free Annapolis through the Office of Emergency Management. They've launched a new web portal that launched in February. It includes online resources, including harm reduction strategies, 
crisis response system contacts, peer support services, and access to data sets, including maps for overdoses by ward. <laughs> this three-pronged approach, approach is in place to make sure we help Annapolis residents in any way we can. I'd like to recognise Tony Strong, Pat Pratt and, <laughs> and William Esther for helping with outreach. If you guys could stand, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for telling your stories at the NapTown events and for making powerful videos with our TV station sharing. Recovery is important. Much of this discussion is about connecting communities. I'd like to announce tonight that we have a plan to build a pedestrian bicycle greenway that we'll be calling Bush Walk. Now, that might sound Australian. <laughs> but we are naming it after Speaker Mike Bush. It will cross Spa Road and adjoin some of the places that people frequent, like Maryland Hall, the Senior Centre, the Library, plus parks, fields and schools, all places he fought for and he supported. Anne Arundel and Annapolis City has just earned the League of American Bicyclists Bronze Award for being a bike-friendly community. I hope next year to report to you that we have connected all the paths and greenways in the master bike plan. <coughs> As you know, we had great success in Ward 2 with a poplar trail that connected Wards 3 to Ward 1. It will be utilised by the very young and very old. It is well maintained by the Germantown Homewood Community Association in partnership with the city and a way for people to get out of their cars. Again for now, in the future, we want to meet people where their transportation needs are. People want more alternatives. We can deliver those without sacrificing anything for our automobile users. We can already see these transportation needs changing with people utilising bicycle shares downtown and young people moving away from automobile ownership and using more rideshare apps and public transport, transit. If you truly care about the environment, you have to consider transit alternatives. Another way to enhance our city is through making sure that we are doing the most to hear from residents. Government doesn't need to be a one-way street. Annapolis has 28 boards and commissions where residents have an opportunity to weigh in on all kinds of issues and report back to the Mayor and Council. There's been a backlog of unfilled seats and they have been underutilised. First, we are working to fill these seats. Second, we're interested in having individuals from all walks of life in these positions. Diversity is important to the city and is important to our administration. I'd like to recognise everyone who has joined the Board or Commission. Please stand. Thank you. Thank you for your volunteerism. Let me go through a number of other quality of life initiatives the city has tackled. First, crime is down. I'd like to thank our police officers for doing all they do. I'd like to do this. We're in the process of finding a new police chief. As I mentioned, we recently held a series of town hall meetings where we heard from residents who are interested in new models of community policing that are more inclusive and focused on building trust in, diverse, in a diverse cross-section of communities. Our planning department has been busy and in the past year unveiled the Bowman Project where six housing units for veterans are placed. In addition, 42 affordable housing units came online with Town Court. Our Pitmoy Recreation Centre awarded about 17,000 in monies for camps and programs and saw roughly 18,000 people taking fitness classes, 
including finish up options for people with disabilities. About a thousand children attended summer camps right here in the city. We got bike shares in downtown that were well utilised with multiple places for pick up and drop off. In transit we made a half a million passenger trips. Our fleet has been updated to reduce pollution and our transportation staff have complete, com completed and delivered to my office a five year plan on transit. We have three new buses with updated fare management. We tripled financing for road paving in 2019 and we are continuing that level for 2020. Our Office of Emergency Management has helped to manage a number of events from the inauguration of the Governor this past January to the hurricane and city preparedness for winter storms, including multiple openings of our warming and cooling centres. In September of this year, we will close Truxton Pool and in 2020 reopen with a beautiful new pool and water park that will be an incredible asset for young and old alike. I love Annapolis. I love being your mayor. I hope you will continue on this wonderful journey of public service together with me. Now we've got some slides from events and activities over the past year. Enjoy the show. Thank you. This has been an update from Eye on Annapolis. Please visit us at ionanapolis.net. Follow us on Twitter at ionanapolis. And be sure to subscribe to our daily news brief podcast, which is delivered every Monday through Friday to your phone or device at 7 a.m.